So uh, today I want to tell you some other stuff about the Aeneas Hefty Dictionary. Um, and, and this is one way in which I like to organize the Aeneas. Okay, so um, this is the first slide I've shown in every single one of these talks, so you wouldn't be able to tell from this point which one of the talks I'm giving. Okay. Uh, now this is important because we're going to see that there's a certain sense in which quantum regression is exactly like that. <laughs> Uh, so um, I'm going to start with a puzzle, which is what's called microcosmality, which is, <clears throat> let's say that you're a pedestrian field theorist, and you think that there's some effective quantum field theory in the world where you can define local operators, and that you're doing things in the background field of some classical field theory, and then you should expect that there's some commutator of phi of x and phi tilde of x prime, on space-like separated points that should vanish, so for spatial separation of course this size. And you want to verify this. Okay, so this is just one of those things that if there were a local field theory in the bot describing uh, some dynamics of some fields, uh, we would want to check that something like this happens. And this is what we many times expect in the h bar to zero limit in gravity, because we expect that the theory should behave classically like quantum fields on top of your background geometry. Um, okay, so this is the way we actually do quantum field theory in the lab when we're talking about CERN, we forget gravity, and then we just do quantum field theory and the computer scattering matrices, all that stuff. So we should be able to do the same. Okay, so, um, and then I told you that there was this thing called the extrapolated dictionary, which is you take your favorite field on the, um, on the bulk, and then you take the limit when rho goes to infinity, and then if you dress it with the right factor of the rho variable and global coordinates, then that is finite, and that's actually what defines the operator on the boundary. So you can think that the operators on the boundary on some fixed Cauchy slice are the limit of operators in the bulk that have been taken to infinity with some dressing time. Okay, so let's take that microcosality statement uh, and then you would say that phi of x commutes with the operator insertions uh, uh, inserted on the boundary, okay? And you would say that it's for all local operators of tilde. This is the first thing, okay? So all tildes were your favorite operators that you can put on the boundary, and usually you have more than one field in the bulk, the commutators between different fields will also vanish. So you can basically assume that this is a version of the truth of something that should be satisfied. So let's try and find operators so five. That that phi, I am a bit confused about bulk and boundary. Yes. So everything is on the bulk or no. Phi is in the bulk. Yeah. Omega t is in the boundary. The expression meaning um, uh, by x t is that I pick some point in this Cauchy slice and I need to keep track of the fact that I fix some time slicing. So I I'm picking the same time slice, so you can think of it as conditions. condition. Um, and then the naive statement is that this will be true for all operators, and even if I take derivatives with respect to t, there's still space like separated, and that will be true for arbitrary numbers of derivatives. So in principle, it should be true. Okay. <coughs> so this is this is a puzzle in the sense that if we want this to be true, then. Uh, we actually run into a problem, which is a quantum field theory theorem, which says that any operator that does that for local operators in quantum field theory is a trivial operator, meaning a constant. And this seems to be a contradiction. Okay? So a, a lot of the stuff I'm going to tell you today is about a particular fix of this contradiction that basically says that that statement can be made to work in an appropriately restricted sense so that uh, you can use that equation uh, under suitable conditions even if you, you, you don't really have that equation anyway. Okay? So um, that's part of the problem is, is that, okay, so how do you do that? Is how do you get around one of these theorems? So the thing is that you have to actually look under the hood of these theorems. And, 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 um, uh, the, the, the statement is, um, you can say that it's twofold. One um, is that phi of x t 
does not necessarily exist in the whole Hilbert space. So you might have trouble defining this everywhere. The, the position x in quantum gravity, once you start going far away from wherever you started, this might not really be an operator that you can define uh, everywhere. So that's one way to, to, to get out of it. But you want something that gives you a, a slightly better description of that. Um, uh, and you want to show that there is a sense in which you can still say that this is true uh, uh, without, uh, uh, in a way that tells you that the fact that your theory is kind of true. Okay, so um, the second thing we need is this thing called the, the, the inversion formula. So there's, just like you could reconstruct the operator O from the extrapolated dictionary, if you take the free field theory limit, so you're assuming really infinite tens and that the fields are free in the bulk, then you can, by the arguments I gave on Monday, um, the field um, is determined by the Fourier coefficient on the boundary, and you can write some inversion formula that says after you do the Fourier coefficients with the right sums, you can recover the field in the bulk. And then all you have to do is insert some kernel k, which does the trick. And then um, explicit expressions can be found in, for example, the paper of Yossi Benner in 99. But the way he wrote it was for Poincare uh, slicing. And he used the momentum representation of everything. So it was not an easy thing to unpack. And then there's this paper of Hannah talking about Lipschitz and Lowe, which gave it not just for the Poincare slicing, but for global ADS and gave a way to write kernels of some more general form, and they computed it. And then they can show that the support of k can be chosen to be compact, uh, and it depends on the radial coordinate of x. And then that they show that basically pi could be written in some form, and you could pay with this. Uh, so the big question is, OK, we have these two things. Both of these things are true, and then it's kind of uh, how do we put it together. Um, so how do we fix the micro society problem? That, that, that's one of those things that, that happens, okay? So there's a set of new ideas that lets you do that, okay? And what you have to be mindful of is that there's more than one kernel that does this inversion. Because I can do the integrals for different regions, and if I do the integrals for different regions, I might be able to work around some stuff to show properties. So this is one of the reasons why this slide's here, is because the k is not unique, because the integral region over which I'm integrating is not necessarily unique either. But phi is always the same. Well, the question is to what extent is it the same every time? Okay? Uh, so there's two new ideas. First one is going to be Ryuta Karani's surfaces, and uh, time is equal to area, and then the second one is going to be So what's Ryuta Karani is a different problem. They started from field theory, and if you separate field theory in some region A and the complement, uh, and if you're, you're in some generic state, like a thermal state, how do you compute the entropy of the region that you have in? Uh, so the idea is that you compute the entanglement entropy with the complement, and that should give you the entropy. And this is very useful in condensed matter physics for all kinds of stuff. So uh, they said, OK, there should be some story also here. So they wrote a conjecture. Okay? Nobody has proved this. So the, the first statement is that this is something we believe about the idea CFT that does not follow from doing brute force computations in field theory any longer. This is something that is at the level of the projection. So the first thing you assume is a time independent geometry. This is all I need right now. Um, and then they say, well, we have whatever geometry, some solution in the bulk that describes my state. And they said, Build the minimal surface anchored on the boundary regions that you care about, between the regions of interest, and then just like we saw that Wilson loops were minimal surfaces. Well, so these are minimal surfaces of a different dimension. And then you calculate the regularized area of the surface. That's the same as before. So it's the same thing as the super webs. But <clears throat> we use this idea of gravity that the area is equal to the entropy. Why? Because it's like it's Hawking kind of. Uh, uh, thermodynamics on a horizon. Okay. This is a conjecture, so what do you do? Um, 
the idea is that you can also use this to say that because you're kind of separating the bulk into two regions, maybe you can use this entanglement surface as something that separates the degrees of freedom that can be reconstructed from one side versus the other. Um, I'm giving things in a different order than it's in the original literature. But this is, a, this is an idea that because you have a thing separating in the bulk, maybe the area that we're computing is also the entropy of whatever bulk thing we have. And in some sense, the things that are inside one side can be separated by this surface, just like we separate points that are accessible from a horizon versus OK. Again, this is conjecture. So um, <clears throat> So it's operated by and uh, it does obey the equation of motion, you can build it. But um, the it doesn't the thing is that we cannot compute these commutators. Uh, in the field theory, a strong company. <laughs> Directly. Well, the point is that I told you that. It, no, the point is that, that that version of HKLL is in the linearized limit, where I basically assume that there's nothing funny, and then you can show it there. Uh, because you've solved the wave equation, and you've solved it. Yes, so this is not. Uh, so, so at this level, the, the question is. Where are we contradicting this theorem? Uh, uh, or how are we contradicting this theorem? Well, it is a problem because we seem to be running into a contradiction. Well, this is a free field theory statement on the bulk, but the point is that the operators that you can insert on the boundary can be arbitrarily messy and not. Yes. Yeah, that, that, that's kind of the. So, so let me tell you what the, what the problem is. If you use this idea of entanglement wedge reconstruction, which is the way this is called, then um, you can take your favorite boundary and divide it into three pieces. This is just a convenient cartoon I'm lifting it from the paper of these guys. Uh, and the idea is that in, from A, you can reconstruct this region. From B, you can reconstruct this region. And from C, you can reconstruct this region. And the point P does not belong to the region that can be reconstructed from A. And it does not belong to the region that can be reconstructed from B. And it does not belong to the region that can be reconstructed from C. So if you take the assumption that the point P um, cannot be reconstructed from C, for example, then what that means is that it belongs to whatever you can do in AB together, but not in C. So whatever you're doing here must commute with whatever's going here, because this kind of slice is cutting you off from one side to the other. So the idea is that the physics at P can be reconstructed from A and B. So A and B together would give you this half the story. And then the point P is inside here. So the idea is that P can be reconstructed from A and B, and from B and C, and from C and A. But whatever's happening at P cannot be reconstructed neither from C nor from A nor from B. So there should be an operator that I can write at P that can be written as an operator in AB, or AC, or CB, but it commutes with A, and B, and C. And that suggests that this, again, should be the identity in that sense. But the, the, the point is that what this really tells you is that there's a notion of the operator at P that can be written in three different forms. And the point is that they're distinct operators. AB, BC, and AC are distinct operators, so the operator 5P is not a unique operator. So the question is, what the hell do we mean by 5P? And, and the idea, this is where codes of spaces work in, is that there is a subset of the Hilbert space of states where the actions of these three different operators produce the same states. So that they act on a subset of the other space so that the matrix elements of A, B, B, C, and A, C on that subspace are actually independent of the fact that I had three different representations. And it is true that if I take two operators that are distinct but have the same matrix elements on a subset of the 
computer space, I cannot distinguish them at that level. And this is what's important. So the idea is that instead of working on the full Hilbert space, you have to cut the Hilbert space to size, and you say that A, B, B, C, and A, C, these things that you can reconstruct, <coughs> are uh, objects that are identical in a subspace of the Hilbert space of states. Okay? And in that subspace of the Hilbert space of states, they have the same matrix element. And I can choose which one of them I use to prove things about them. So in particular, this paper on Harry Lowe, uh, Lowe Harlow said that, well, there's, let's say, a Hilbert space of A and B and C. Yes? Do, do, do they commute in general? Phi AB, Phi AC? No. Within the subspace? In the subspace, they do. That's exactly the point. In the subspace, the codes of space will belong to the tensor product A, B, C. Okay? Uh, and the physics of B can be reconstructed by dropping any one of the factors. <clears throat> so there's a subslice of the space where I can define operators that act just on this H code, but can be solved as operators that act on two factors here, or on two factors here, or on two factors uh, in any uh, in one of them. So the upshot is that if you have two elements of the code Hilbert space, then um, by using different representations of P and by using the matrix elements of phi and C inside the of space, properly projected, then these commutators are weakly zero in the sense that they're only true inside matrix elements of the subspace of the Hilbert space. Okay? So this is very similar to some of the things that we do with gauge symmetry in that some things are made weakly zero uh, as matrix elements in some subset of states, but that they're distinct from zero in you know, more general. So the idea is that you have to basically take your Hilbert space and have to cut it to size and say that there's a subset space of the Hilbert space where this is true, and then you don't run into a contradiction because the contradiction only arises from assuming that those commutators are exactly identically equal to zero in the full Hilbert space of all of the states of your field theory. So that doesn't restrict them in any way whatsoever when you are actually making statements about the smaller Hilbert space. So the idea of a code of space is that it is a Hilbert space in the sense that any two vectors in there can be superposed and you can do quantum mechanics inside the smaller Hilbert space. And you're inside there and you're acting with operators that kind of preserve the code, as it's called, um, uh, then you, you, you're you kind of safe. So, yes? Are there restrictions on the point P in, in ADS? No. All the points P are equivalent to each other by an isometry. So, so what if P lies in, in a, in a tangent shadow? We're talking about vacuum ADS. Ah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so this idea is about just the naive ADS space. The whole point is that this is about solving certain class of paradoxes. Um, uh, so this gives you an idea of, of that we, we, we need to think a little bit more cleverly and a little bit more restrictively about comparing things on one side to the other, and then basically we many times have to put bounding boxes, and we cannot talk about generic states and generic statements about these things. These operators do not in some sense exist outside of the codes of space. Uh, the idea is that since if you apply enough times an operator, eventually you get out of whatever bounding box you have, the codes of space really requires some, some notion that uh, the phi of p kind of cannot get you out of it, so you have to put restrictions on how many times you have to apply it, and you have to kind of add a whole bunch of extra bells and whistles just to make sure that this equation makes sense where it needs to make sense. Sorry, but this H code in, on which data does it depend? It depends on the... It depends on the point p. So the idea is that the cost of space depends on but some cutoffs. So the points p were equivalent? Yeah, so let's say that you want to have one particle state. Okay, that's good, but can you do one million particle states? No. 
kind of do uh, 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 two particles with very high momentum on top of each other that will produce a black hole. No, so you have to kind of say that it's some notion of what we would call a low energy effective theory, but you're, you're allowed to do some boost so long as the constituents are still relatively slow in the rest frame to, to the extent that you can say that. Okay, so this is one of those things that uh, is kind of wishy-washy in the sense that um, the cutoffs need to be whatever they have to be so that you don't run into trouble. That's a very bad way of doing physics because you don't know when you're going to run into trouble. But to the extent that we don't want to produce black holes and we don't want to change the background geometry and want to do things perturbatively, uh, there's still a question of can you, is this enough to do some proper notion of effective theory or not? Or run into trouble. Okay. What is the definition of Asian code here? Um, it's the Hilbert space in which this makes sense. <laughs> So codes of space is the language of quantum information theory where they want to protect against certain classes of error corrections. So here I told you that you can reconstruct the message, also known as the point P, the physics of P, by deletions. So if I delete any one of the three, I don't care what's in there, I can reconstruct that point. So this is a particular way of saying that this protects against errors that produce deletions of information on A or B or C. And where twiggle means up to, is there like a parameter that tells us that the number is similar to zero? The twiggle means that um, gamma and gamma prime are sufficiently restricted so that if I apply 5p in some more complicated state, I, when I try to get outside, I might get non-zero. So this is zero on a sufficiently big slice, and then if I try to get outside, I might run it strong. But then, I don't know, I would like a definition of H code as all the gamma gamma primes such that that is equal to zero. Well, that's one definition. <laughs> but then I have to tell you what the different reconstructions of 5P are. So the 5P have to be equivalent to each other. That depends on choices that are made. So there's no one unique H code because there's no one unique 5P, but the different 5P have the same matrix elements inside whatever I call the codes of space. So you know, it's one of those things that tells you you need bounding boxes. And the size of the bounding box kind of goes to infinity as n goes to infinity. So it's always a problem of when I start interacting with n as opposed to order one. So it, it, in some sense, it's something that if it's there, you won't really see it in perturbation theory. So th this is one of those things that this seems to be a non-perturbative way of thinking about physics that, that requires uh, uh, thinking about finite n to actually make sense of what these bounding boxes are. Okay, so I'm going to give you a second paradox, which is that there is no topology operator in LLM geometry. Okay, so we saw LLM geometries yesterday, and then you might say, okay, there's LLM geometries, and I told you that different topologies of these droplets gave different topologies of space time. So one of the questions that you can ask is, can I write an operator that measures the topology of these droplets and that classifies the states according to the topology and that says that states of the same topology uh, are eigenstates of the topology operator with different eigenvalues if they have different topologies. So this is the idea of what is an operator. Uh, so let me remind you, this is what the things were. Uh, it's just to tell you that there are exact metrics and we can solve them. Um, and there's, there was also fluxes. Um, and the point is that these are classical solutions. So if you have classical solutions, you can think of the Hilbert space made from the span of these classical solutions. So you can think of them as a mini superspace of quantum gravity in the sense that you, you have a set of states and you can do superpositions on them and they satisfy some equations. And then it's not the most general solution of supergravity, but a consistent set of solutions of supergravity. And then if you take this things, you can quantize them semi-classically, and this was done by Grant, Grant Maus, Stanley Pantelina, and Bichkov. And then, after a lot of work, uh, they found that it was the same thing that you get from just a naive quantum whole droplets uh, picture. So it's a result of this free quantization. Okay. Sorry, Dave, can I just, just, just to make sure, when you say topology of the droplet, you mean two droplets versus a droplet with a puncture versus... Yes. So you think that because we can define it in the classical physics that there's a topology operator that does it. 
Uh, and the point is that uh, it's known, uh, but the way to make it shine is you take limits so that the physics is easy. And one of the limits is take n to infinity so that in some formal sense you're going to have free string theory. So you don't have to worry about non planarities and interactions. Take the energy to be finite so the energy in the Planck units can be can finite. The droplet is nearly circular, small edge fluctuations. Um, and then this is described as a free string. Uh, and then the edge fluctuations of this quantum droplet is what people call a C plus 1 in that moon car boson. And this is what people have known from quantum web since forever. And the point is that this is a free field theory. So if you have a free field theory, you can do computations and you can do oscillator expansions. So why are we taking a limit first? Well, you know, paradoxes usually become apparent when you push them to the limits. Um, and then the limit here is a technicality, it's restrained. You can do it in some other sense, but the point is that you get an exact fault space, and then this lets you define this thing in, in, in a way that's nice. Um, and we can do things also at finite end, but it's much, much more work, and, and it doesn't really matter. So to see the limit geometrically, the radius are kind of gross like square root of n, and we want to take n to infinity. So you want to take the radius and regularize it. So you define a variable h, which is r squared over 2 minus r0 squared over 2. And you're going to polar coordinates so that the h theta is rd rd theta, which is the usual measure. And since these droplets were are preserving, uh, the measure here is the same measure that we over here. So we're preserving the IM. There's an IR preserving way of zooming onto the edge. Um, and when you do the radial integral for the energy, you find that the energy goes like the function h of theta squared theta. And this is just doing the change of variables. And then the configuration space classically is that h can go from negative infinity to positive infinity due to this double scaling. Because now r0 squared is infinite. So h can go from plus infinity to minus infinity. And the angle is imperiodic. So what you have is kind of fermions, or you have a rotor picture on a cylinder. OK. <clears throat> and now I want to map this h of theta to the current boson. And then what happens is that h of theta, this high function, is the charge density of the current boson. Work there, it doesn't matter much. But when you quantize, you say that the energy is the normal order version of this h of theta squared, the theta. Uh, and then if you use that h of theta is the x, then this thing is telling you that the stress tensor is the x squared, which is the usual thing that you know. <laughs> so what that tells you is that the quantization of this stuff gives you the naive quantization of the Carl boson for the, uh, for the stress tensor. And the, what we call the energy in gravity is the same thing that we call the energy in the quantum field theory. <clears throat> and now this statement about the pre carl boson is an exact statement about the Hilbert space of states that in some sense follows from ABS-CFT because I can do the matrix model and the matrix model I can deduce all this stuff. OK. <clears throat> and um, the reason why everything is free is because what people call large n factorization. OK. So now I've reduced things in this case. And I say, OK, this is my list of, of things. And now I want to give you the argument for not topology operator. So the first statement is that I have an oscillator expansion, so I can write my field h of theta as a linear combination of raising and lowering operators. And I can do this because I have a free fog space. So I can write it this way. And I can consider coherent states, meaning classical solutions of h of theta, so that they are eigenstates of the lowering operators for the different nodes that I have. And then when you compute the expectation value of h, you get whatever coefficients you have there. And you can also show that for these days, the energy is equal to the classical value of the energy that we have for these objects. <clears throat> so this is the closest approximation to classical field in the quantum theory, meaning that the naive energy is the energy of h. And then you look at these configurations, and you say, well, you know, classically, it's a single value at high angle. Uh, the edge of the classical configuration has a topology of a circle, and it's the same topology as the vacuum solution. So I should assign it the vacuum topology. And the other thing that you know for coherent states is that they're generating series for all of the 
uh, high court states in the field theory, so they're over complete. And then um, any other state can be written as linear combinations of coherent states. And then the point is that when you take this limit, you can show that there are configurations that have finite energy where you have some, let's say, band structure and where you've kind of punctured this thing in some finite radius and then you have three edges, one to three, rather than one edge, so you can change the topology. So this trap geometry is a limit of the geometries with the required constraints. Uh, it has different topology. And now I can tell you why there's no topology operator is a contradiction. You assume that it exists, then different topologies should be assigned different T eigenvalues. Um, all coherent states should have the trivial eigenvalue because they all look like classical configurations. And then uh, all their superpositions have trivial eigenvalue because if I take a topology operator and I superpose states that have some fixed eigenvalue, their superposition has the same eigenvalue. And then the point is that uh, because this is over complete, the, the coherent states are over complete, uh, I get a contradiction. Some states that are these band states have non trivial topology, but they are superpositions of trivial states. So this is based on you know, a bunch of papers that I did with my student Alexander Miller. Um, and the point is that um, topology is not an operator. So here's the second thing we learn about the ADSFT that sometimes what we think of as classical observables in gravity, in classical gravity, might not be operators in quantum mechanics that describe observables in the sense of a Hilbert space of states and one-shot kind of objects. Okay, there's another development, which was this paper of Margaret and Hans Nook, which he said that from looking at the double side black hole, that the topology of the configurations, whether there's a uh, I got Einstein Rosen bridge or not, uh, um, is captured by the entanglement between the two sides of the double sided black hole. Uh, uh, basically, he said topology is captured by entanglement, and we know that entanglement is not an operator. So there's some other space, other place where we found, or where Mark conjectured that, you know, you can capture topology by considering entanglement. Okay. So whatever happened is that the new states, whatever they are, cannot be coherent states because if they were, they would have trivial topology and they would have just one edge. Uh, so what are the properties of coherent states that you want to check? They usually have minimal uncertainty and they're factorized between the modes. So you want to check to what extent that's not true. So you want to check for violation of this stuff. And the point is that how do you check for violation of minimal uncertainty? Well, you compute the uncertainty. So you measure the uncertainty of the mode. And the uncertainty of the mode is also not an operator measurement. Why? Because you take an expectation value, then you take the operators, subtract the expectation value, you square that, and then you take the expectation value again. This is a nonlinear function in quantum mechanics. But we've all computed uncertainties of operators in quantum mechanics. Everybody does that. And we don't bat an eye, it's just that that's not an observable can be computed. In a lab, it can be verified experimentally that you have some given uncertainty. But it requires an ensemble of measurements, and you need to uh, get the ensembles. And you won't be able to get it on a one-shot measurement or something. You have to do repeat an experiment, collect data, and then compute the uncertainty like we do in classical probability. So, and now to check violation of factorization, if a state is not factorized, then it's entangled. <laughs> So you have to compute entanglement entropy for the different modes. Now I'm going to use some intuition, which is that basically there should be edge excitations on each one of these edges. So you should be able to write edges, and these things I'm going to call them anti-edges. And each effective field should have some canonical commutation relations in the sense that the limits that we usually take for a chiral boson is that the edge dynamics is kind of independent of where you are and then actually true. So after some work, I can show that the raising operators of the original three Carl Bolson field theory should be written as some linear combinations of some other fields, um, signs of some convention. Uh, and then, because I took a subtract geometry, then Fourier coefficients kind of have to match. 
And you can think of this as a partial Bogor Euler transformation. And I'm being cavalier here because I'm telling you that I can just Fourier transform things and I'm comparing Fourier transform Okay. Where these you have canonical commutation relations. Okay, so the, the point is that I want to write this stuff as this linear combination. Uh, how do you prove that? Okay, so I'll put a black box there. Um, the idea is that we know what these truck geometries are. They are kind of rectangular against the loss. Uh, this was in the original paper of Dino uh, Nina um, And then um, one of the things that you have to know about the Carl boson is that um, their states can be computed just by taking act law. So what you see is that if you add boxes here, subtract boxes over here, and add boxes over here, the states that are near this rectangular yang tableau can be written as a product of a small yang tableau here, another yang tableau here, and another yang tableau here. So locally, you think that the hyperspace of states looks exactly like a product of three Carla bosons, where you have one here, one here, and one here. Um, and then again, you have to add this idea of the cost of space, which is that the extra modes that I wrote, those Fourier modes, only exist near the reference state. There's few boxes on top or below. Um, so as I said, the way to talk about this is that this is a closed space. I have a reference state. I have my raising and lowering operators. I describe them combinatorially by adding boxes. Um, and all computation relations that I need between the different modes are zero by virtue of the fact that the Hilbert space is kind of factorized. So the modes B will commute with each other because they work on different yang law and the C modes also. Um, and, and the philosophy, which is similar to the one of Propala and Manzimandu, is that you have a reference state. In this case, it's a rectangular yang law, but in principle, I can do it for other states. I have some raising operators that I can act on this reference state and produce new states. And then I take a small set of these objects and I take the span of these objects. So this is a Hilbert space of states in the sense that I have some bases and I've generated something. And I can produce quantum mechanics with this stuff. And then there's implicit cutoffs everywhere in the sense that the occupation number, the effective energy, long wave and all of this stuff is kind of in here. So in general, the idea is that to do effective field theory, you need a vacuum, that's omega, and you need some low energy excitations, which are these alpha dagger effective. And the point is that you cannot go to a full Fox space, you get a partial Fox space where the occupation numbers are cut off, and where your wave numbers are also cut off in the UV, and usually all of this is implicit. Okay. Yes? In this case, your, your omega is a Young diagram of long edges. Yes. And uh, so, so the cutoffs here would make sure that you don't start to look too much. You know, to row the corner. Yeah, yeah. so uh, uh, let, let me get to that. And let me ask this. What happens if it's triangular? Uh, that's rubbish. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so you don't um, have low energy effective Theory for that no, there are effective field theory, but it's, uh, it's a rubbish set in the sense that something like that turns out to be more like a black hole. So it's not something where it's a naive geometry in the usual sense. And, and, you know, we're trying to look into this, but uh, I, 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 I'll be kind of uh, uh, a punt on that one. Uh, we'll talk about it later. Okay. So what's the idea? The nearby set of states was kind of the paper space of blue, then red, green, then red. You can actually do everything combinatorially. And then the BC modes do not exist globally, so they exist only near reference state. The computation relations start failing when adding or subtracting boxes at the corners start interfering. So you cannot kind of go to arbitrarily large sizes. You see that if you put the Yang Tableau, you, they'll touch eventually and that will spoil your computation relations. But near the ground state, and for small numbers of excitations, they're separated, and therefore inside the console space these commutators are zero. They don't commute with the UV modes. Again, this is combinatorics. Uh, I'm not showing you where these combinatorics came from, but you can show this. Is that if you take something of size L plus M, L plus M is the size of these things, and uh, you put them in this order, 
you need to implement one and it's different than when you act in the opposite order. So this is one of those things where, where, where one can show that this object does not commute with the UV modes and you get different results or different actions on a particular state, which is a nice thing. So um, both of these things are required because um, otherwise the degrees of freedom of one carabozo will be exactly identical to the degrees of freedom of three carabozos, right? One for each one of the edges, and it will be equal to the degrees of freedom of five carabozos. You might put stripe geometries with more stripes. And then that would seem like a multiplication of the Fishers or a Hilbert Hotel. So if you have a Hilbert Hotel, basically you can keep on adding things and it would tell you that there's some sense in which you know, one is equal to infinity. Okay, so um, you do that. Uh, so the next thing that you can do is compute um, uncertainties. So from the fact that these dagger operators are written this way, and that this reference state is annihilated by the annihilation operators built combinatorially. You can compute the uncertainty and entropy of, of a state. Um, and you can compute this expectation value. And you can show that this captures the number of edges. So this is one for when you have one edge, and two when you have two edges. And then if you do it in the opposite order, you get the number of anti-edges. And this is independent of the mode. So what that tells you is that even if there's some excitations, if you tabulate all of these things together, you can say what the average number of the edges is, and then most of them will have the same number, and a few of them will have excitations, and then you use basically a, a majority vote, and then basically whoever is disgruntled, you throw away. <laughs> you don't have to have an opinion. Okay, so what's the point? Um, I can also change the state by unitaries on each mode without changing the entanglement. And you can also compute the entanglement. Uh, and you can actually destroy the uncertainty on each mode and correlations also without changing the entanglement. So this should be non-geometric. So not, the, not every state that you get is going to look nice and geometric. So you're able to keep the entanglement fixed and modify the uncertainty by doing just a unitary thing, like in the previous state on scrambling and mapping. So if you have entanglement, it's not enough. If you have uncertainty, it's not enough. And if you have both of them together, and if the entanglement is kind of maximal consistent with the uncertainty, or the uncertainty is minimal consistent with the entanglement, then that's about as classical as you can get. And then maybe, maybe the, the, the thing is classical. Okay, great. So as I said, um, causal spaces come to rescue. So again, if topology is not an operator, just by walking a few steps, you say, well, the topology can be computed from a metric, and if that is not an operator, might as well the metric not be an operator. So can we see some contradiction with the metric being an operator in the Hilbert space of states? Um, and then um, there's an illustrative example where uh, you can start with a three-ring geometry, and you can make excitations of this edge or excitations of this edge. And then um, by taking a superposition, you can peel it off from this edge, and you can get a D ring that looks like this. And by doing excitations from this edge, you can get a D ring that looks like this. So by doing superpositions, you can get something that looks the same as starting from this edge than as starting from this other edge. And then this one, in one view of the physics, is well some quantum state that comes from superpositions of coherent states like this. So it should be an excitation that's attached to this side over here. And the other one, this should be an excitation that's attached to this side over here. And you say, how can that be? How can I say that something belongs to two different sides? What happens is that the reference state that you start with here is different than the reference state that you start with here. So your assignment of to what side of this thing should I assign some node or some particular state uh, depends on the reference state in which I started. So <clears throat> I might be able to produce the same reference state on both sides, but I would disagree on what the metric is relative to the reference state. Different reference states give you different notions of the metric. Okay, but um, you just thought of it as what's the quantum 
metric, that state, you say, no, this is a contradiction. This, this cannot work. So what's the solution? The solution is that if you have a semi-classical reference state, we assign raising and lowering operators, which is part of the data of the vacuum. And then we're allowed to build a metric operator around the reference state by saying, well, I have the modes, and I build the Hilbert Fox space, so I can compare to a linearized field theory. And that describes the linearized fluctuations around my field. And because I have the linearized fluctuations and I can do the space dynamics, I can build an effective field theory near the reference state. Uh, and I can build something that looks like a metric operator near the reference state. And that's only perturbatively around the reference state. If I start from a different reference state and I get to the same state, and I have a completely different notion of what the metric is. And the point is that there's no contradiction because the two metric operators are only defined by comparing to the corresponding linearized fluctuations with the reference state. And the point is that there's no map that maps them both together into a single independent notion of the metric that is independent of the reference state. But this lets you get around the problem of the topology because you say, if I start with a fixed topology for my reference state, and I call it whatever it is, small fluctuations around it shouldn't change that topology, because I'm not allowed to do that in perturbative gravity. So I can basically say that the topology of my state is the topology of the reference state, and then it's OK. And then if I have another reference state that has a different topology and produces the same state, I would say, well, that state has a different topology uh, in that other code subspace. And then the point is that if I try to put them together, we will not agree on what is the topology of the state, but that's OK. So you can kind of trivialize the topology thing and make it into an operator in the sense of perturbative physics around each one of the reference states, and you're OK. OK, so this idea is that these operators only exist inside the codes of space. And then you kind of say that your big Hilbert space is divided into little Hilbert spaces, which are codes of spaces. And in each one of these codes of spaces, you can do effective field theory. And when you try to make different codes of spaces and add them into something bigger, you get into trouble with the naive notions of what we think of as quantum gravity. And therefore, you should drop the idea that the metric is an operator. Okay. Um, so you just do that, but it's no contradiction with effective field theory. The point is that this is kind of engineered to let you do effective field theory without ever having to worry about this stuff. But it is perturbative, effective field theory, in the sense that all the states are contracted, constructed perturbatively from your reference state. And this obstruction is, in a sense, inherently non-perturbative. Okay? So what's the consequence? It's that you can actually still do effective field theory, so we don't break our notions of what constitutes in physics. Um, there's just no global picture of what's going on that satisfies all of the things that we want. But anytime we need it, it's going to be there. <laughs> and that's very annoying, actually. It uh, doesn't give you a plan for what quantum geometry is. It tells you that there's kind of little patches where you can define it, and there's no global picture. And then we know that we need something else, but this didn't tell us what it was. It just told us that we're kind of OK. Um, and in the generic case, there seems to be no non-perturbative solution. This means beyond code space approximation of what physics look like. Okay. Uh, and then there's a question, this ambiguity in the finite metric is related to dualities in the sense that if you take dualities, that also tells you that there's no unique geometry, but you can kind of map between one and the other one, and you can do a dictionary. But the people will not agree on what the geometry is, but you can translate from one duality frame to another one, and this would let you also translate it from one code space to the other one, but then some horrible map of the states that can be mapped from one side to the other one, and just declaring that the operators that restrict you to these things get mapped to the operators on the other side, and whatever that is, you can have the map. Okay, that's the point. Um, okay, so that's it. I'm done. <laughs> uh, this is a set of puzzles, and I hope you're happy. Uh, the, 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 the,
then should be also not one of the points which the transition functions can be too young, which would be too false, and things like that. Oh, um, so, do they actually decay more? Is that so? Um, well, that's one of those statements where if you have a default, then the notion of the metric is kind of not very well behaved. It's only well behaved up to monodromy, but there's something that we can kind of pretend that we understand, which is this kind of fiber bundle structure around it. And we say that that's quantum geometry. Uh, I, I think that this does not contradict that. Um, uh, I, 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 so I, I think that's allowed. I, 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 yeah, I think that's allowed. It's just that the point at which the um, vibration goes bad is non geometric in some sense. Okay, so, but we can describe the physics there. There's ways we can do it in conformity theory many times. Okay. Wrong statement. <laughs> There's a sense in which we think that we can describe these situations and it work. Uh, Any more questions? Yes. yes. This is uh, really mostly holographic constructions. Uh, so is it true in black space? For the black space gravity that there is no well, my feeling is that um, anything that happens in ABS gravity, if gravity is universal, and you can do it locally and you, in gravity, and you can make these bubbles small and local in that case, you can probably do it also in flat space, so there will be a problem with flat space, but you would never be able to detect it for big geometric solutions, you need to kind of go to a limit where the topology change is small and can be realized also by you know, small energy configuration, which you would think of as being part of a flat space geometry. So you need to be able to take limits in a way that makes these things kind of break in the same way. So I think it's possible. Um, uh, but this has to do with the UV structure of the theory, right? If you just do the effective theory of space thing, you never change the topology and it's all fluctuations around the vacuum. And it's only when you try to define the theory non-perturbatively that you're going to run into trouble. So, so you know, to be fastidious, fastidious and stuff like that, you say, well, maybe this tells us that loop quantum gravity is a complete nonsense because they assume that the metric is an operator. <coughs> okay, that this is a, that the microscopic description is in the sense of some sort of, you, you take, triangulation you define some sort of notion of discretized gravity and he's an operator in that case. And this will tell you maybe that doesn't work. Okay. But this is a construction in a particular framework with some stuff and then it's not clear that that stuff doesn't work either. It's just, you know, if this is universal then it doesn't work. If it's not universal and there's more than one model of gravity, I can't tell you that. more questions? Yes. So you wrote down a quadrilateral like transformation A equals D1 equals B2 plus C. Yes. Now, is that a specific example, a specific number of particles, or is that something which is put over this way? Would you have multiply defined or multiply defined defining these partial quadrilateral like transformations? Ah, How do they appear? Okay, so now uh, th th that's kind of the, the looking under the hood of how you define the actions of the A's on these young diagrams. So that's a combinatorial way of describing that. Uh, and then you define the B's and C's similarly. Then you can check that that linear combination is what shows up inside the cold subspace around this. Then we have more stripes. The partial probability transformation has more of these objects. But the point is that that linear combination is enough to let you compute uncertainties. And if you kind of ignore the fact that there's a cutoff, uh, uh, the partial probability transformation has some entanglement entropy that we can compute. In the modes, that that's basically a sweet state type entropy. And the point is that the tails don't contribute. The tails are so suppressed that they don't contribute. So you can basically say that that infinite fox space approximation actually fits very well with the entanglement that you get inside the code system, inside the for that mode, um, because the tails basically contribute zero to the entanglement. So it's a finite piece of the Hilbert space that's doing all the work. So that, that, that's how it works in that case. So, so, but the point is that because it's a volume of transformation, we can compute everything. <laughs> Any more questions? OK, I think we'll leave there for today. We, uh, let's thank the speaker again. Uh, I believe now it's uh, lunch, and then we have some
some recreation plan for off -keys. See you then.